Hello and welcome to Do Not Disturb mode, that is fine tuning resources for latency sensitive, sensitive workloads. My name is Antti Kervinen, I work for Intel and I've been working on resource management, especially on the CRI and OCI runtimes. Hello, my name is Peter Hunt. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat, working primarily on cryo, but also on things in SIGnode and uh, other computer-related technologies. And I, we also wanted to send a special shout out. This uh, presentation and work was partially brought to you by Marcus Lutzman, who also works at Intel. I uh, did the uh, integration and design of the RDP work that we're going to describe a little bit. So. To start off, we're going to describe, talk a little bit about uh, QoS, or quality of service in Kubernetes. Uh, since the beginning, Kubernetes has provided knobs to configure how different workloads are prioritized and how they're configured to run on a node. So the QoS classes were used to specify memory limits and CPU limits, as well as uh, boom killing behavior for different pods. And uh, this uh, behavior was able to be further customized by CPU management policies to be able to configure which uh, CPUs uh, workloads ended up on, which allows uh, for users to configure CPU affinity so that there isn't a noisy neighbor problem among different workloads. But this uh, leaves a lot of other resources that exists on the node but aren't quite as uh, possible to configure and this uh, causes workloads to be disturbed when it would be a little bit better if they were less disturbed uh, and were given more access to those resources and were less latent. So Cryo has recently, and there's a PR and continuity as well, but in Cryo 1.22 we have uh, the capability of configuring uh, two new resources um, this, the first one is uh, Intel's Resource Director Technology, or RDT. It is a way to configure uh, cache and memory bandwidth. Um, so you can think of it as the finer grain control over the way that uh, memory and the uh, memory bandwidth in the CPU cache are uh, configured. And next we have uh, the capability of configuring block IO classes. Uh, in a similar way as the QoS class, this gives class-based, uh, you know, on a C group granularity block IO uh, controller. Uh, so you can configure how, given a C group, you can figure how uh, that C group is uh, able to, uh, the scheduler is uh, going to prioritize it. You can give it extra weight or you can throttle that workload so that it can only access a certain amount of the, um, the block IO. So let's describe you know, the situation before any of this QoS stuff. So we have our three workloads uh, running on the same cluster. It's a very realistic scenario of having 911, our emergency uh, telephone service, and a flower delivery service, which is an important uh, you know, site that it needs to stay up because it's you know, people want to be able to order their flowers at all the time, but if it goes down or if it, you know, lags a little bit, uh, no one's going to get hurt. And then finally, we have a scan file system, which will look all over the file system and, you know, see what's out there. Um, this is something that we want to be doing fairly regularly, but we don't want to be, you know, it's, it's not really mission critical. There's no apps or, you know, things that will go down if it doesn't run. So, it is our lowest priority. So by default, if we just run on a Kubernetes cluster, no configurations of limits or memory or anything like that, uh, this is the, what it's gonna look like. Each of these three workloads are gonna end up on each of these uh, three CPUs, uh, the two CPU cores, and they're gonna be uh, split up among, they're gonna argue with each other in the cache, causing uh, you know things to get evicted back and forth. They're going to contend for memory bandwidth as well as uh, for storage block IO. So this is not great if we want our 911 process to you know, be undisturbed. 
So the first thing we can do is, and this is available as a, like 112 beta, so it's it's fairly uh, you know well tested now. Um, is setting a static CPU manager policy. So this allows the user to configure which CPU affinity each of the uh, processes are scheduled onto. This allows for you know the 911 process to have its own dedicated CPU, and no other process would get in the way of it. Thus, a lot like allowing it to you know be uh, less late. And then the other two processes can go on the other core, and they can share, and they can contend with each other, and it's not as big a deal. But we still have all of these other resources that they're contending with. So something we can do now with Cryo 1.22 is uh, configure the uh, the uh, CPU cache um, behavior so that um, the the 911 process has a uh, you know is given uh, the a specific uh, you know weight to how uh, its uh, cache is being configured and it can uh, run a little bit nicer um, with less contention around it. Uh, further, we can uh, configure how our scan file system process, which is a lot less important, um, is configured with memory bandwidth so we can throttle the memory bandwidth uh, allowing for the fi scan file system process to not take up too many of the uh, too much memory bandwidth that would contend with the 911 or the flower delivery processes which are much more important next up we have the capability of uh, throttling uh, giving higher block IO priority so by default, you know, uh, any the block I/O priority weight is 100. So if we give the 911 process a weight of 400, that makes it uh, have higher priority, and it's given access to the block I/O scheduling more frequently, and it's allowed to do its things faster, which means it can run in, uh, you know, a more in a way that it gives it more access to the node, and um, it can run less disturbed. Finally, we can also throttle the block I.O. And this allows us to specify a specific amount of, uh, you know, read and write rate that a certain C group is given access to. In this case, our scan file system process is only going to get access to a certain amount, a certain rate. And this will also free up room for the flower delivery and 911 services. In other words, with all of these uh, all of these capabilities combined, we're giving this 911 access to all of these resources in a way that it is, uh, you know, relatively undisturbed, um, much like this cute puppy here. Uh, so 911 can do all of its normal activities and not uh, worry about resource contention with other processes. So next up, we're going to have to do a bit of a demo uh, of the block IO throttling. Thanks, Peter. So I'll start sharing my console. And now that we know that what can be done on the slides, let's see that how it works on the virtual machine. So in my virtual machine setup, I have a configuration file added for cryo which tells that there is a separate block IO config file where block IO classes are defined and the file is in the ETC containers. And if we check the contents of that file, there is a single class definition. So there's a slow reader class introduced in this file. And the introduction goes so that for all the block devices that match this regular expression, this wild card, actually, uh, for all those block devices, throttle reading to down to the five megabytes per second. And now we are going to start our file system scanner here that would go to this class. So let's see how this file system scanner pod and actually daemon set YAML looks like. 
So uh, in the annotations, you can find block IO resources, beta, Kubernetes IO uh, annotation. And I'm giving it the scope of pod, meaning that I want this annotation to apply to all containers inside this pod. I could also give here a container name to uh, restrict to it, this, this uh, block IO class only to a container. Okay. And the block IO class name is the slow reader. And how this file system scanner then works, there's one container running busybox and inside the busybox it is running a while loop and inside the while loop it is looking for files under the scan directory and it is passing those files as command line arguments to md5sum and then that would be sorted and saved to a file and then the files would be diffed compared to previous md5sums and that way we could track that what is actually what is changed in the file system and what are the checksums for all this, all these files. So the most important thing here is actually to note that what is actually being done and who is actually reading the block devices uh, is the md 5 sum process. So it is reading the files. And maybe for completeness, I'll show quickly that what is under the scan. So in the scan directory, I have mounted user bin and user lib from the host file system as read only mounts. Okay, I think that we are ready to launch this file system scanner. There it is. And if we now check out what these C groups look like, so I have a helper script digging out groups details, I can see that in the default namespace there is a file system scanner pod, inside it there is a busy box container, and for that container in, in its C groups there is a read uh, BPS device file for block IO controller defined, and it has found two devices from this virtual machine. So two devices are actually matching this wildcard here and the read is now limited down to five megabytes per second for both of those devices. Let's see now the MD5 process really should be running. And if I'm checking out that what's in the proc and pit of uh, MD5 and IO file, so there is something really happening, numbers are changing. So if I take this nice little uh, polling loop here and compare the numbers all the time to the previous ones that we have read and make that human readable, we can see that uh, it's always the five megabytes per second at most that the MD5 sum process is reading. Okay, so now we have seen that this, this actually works. So we can now continue and take a step back and think that what have we actually introduced here in a bigger scale. So I'll start sharing the tab again. And let's see. So we have been defining here first steps for this kind of class-based QoS. So we have enabled workloads to be annotated with QoS related class names. There is block IO classes and there are RDT classes. Both for uh, that can like for high priority workloads and also sort of limiting classes for low priority workloads, which we want to make sure that won't interfere that much with other higher priority workloads. And here, uh, the name of the class in the workload configuration is, is kind of node independent. So we, at this point where workloads are annotated, we don't actually have to care too much about the node 
hardware details. So we do not give any absolute numbers here, for instance. But those are hidden inside the uh, per node configuration files that are read by container runtimes, cryo in this example. And uh, here, why, why we are doing this so that we have this kind of uh, node configurations separately is that if you think of the block IO, for instance, and compare a spinning hard drive to SSD, or compare that to non-volatile memory like Optane, um, the characteristics of those block devices in performance sense are completely different. So the values how you would like to throttle this kind of file system scanner on real hard, like physical hard drive or non-volatile memory, those values could be totally different. But anyway, you might want to have this kind of a heterogeneous cluster where you really have different kind of nodes and it would be very nice to be able to schedule this kind of jobs on any node so scan for instance scan file system on any node so that it won't disturb the more prior higher, higher priority jobs on those nodes and now this node specific configurations that depends on the hardware characteristics enable you to do that. So keep it simple in the workload and in the user perspective. Then a couple of words about the QoS in future. So this is what we have been uh, getting so far up and running. And uh, what we are doing is using the annotations as you saw, and th this is good and only good for working, getting this working now. But obviously, this is not a long-term solution. So there needs to be some cleaner, cleaner way to do the class-based QoS in the future. On the other hand, uh, in Kubernetes, there the resources, the numbers for CPU and memory, they currently imply the whole um, QoS class for the container and for the pod. And that QoS class then implies things like how to be how to configure out of memory killer and whether or not this pod should have exclusive cpus and if you think about the future where the hardware is going there is going to be different memory types you might have like high bandwidth memory you might have low latency memory and not that low latency memory and there might be different cpu core speeds that you would like to somehow uh, state for your workloads that this workload would prefer like a slow uh, low power cpu or another workload would ne really need like high performance cores these kind of things i do not believe that we can anymore or any longer co encode to these numbers of cpu and memory what is requested and limited so uh, one way just a food for thought for the qs future I'd like to like uh, sketch somehow that how this could be made more explicit. So of course we could have these numbers for limits and requests as we have done for now and have the default behavior unchanged so that everything would be backwards compatible. But in order to make this more future proof, uh, one option could be to introduce this kind of QoS section or container resources where we could be giving them this kind of RDT and block IO classes, how we want this uh, workload to be run. And why not at the same time enable uh, overriding this kind of implicit assumptions that we have had for out of memory killer or CPU exclusiveness, or at maybe at some point for memory speed and latency. These kind of things could be then stated explicitly. And even if we were to have this kind of QoS section also in the pod level and not only on container level, then we could also affect the assumptions that we have on pod level QoS, like ev eviction. So when Kubelet is noticing that it, uh, node resources are running low, it starts to evict pods that are not high, high priority. So why not make that also explicit 
so that users can configure it as they want and not only imply through the numbers of CPU and memory. But anyway, that was just a food for thought for the future. And let's get back and wrap up what we have actually been doing. So we've been tuning workloads. We have seen that, okay, there is already a good way to say that this workload needs explicit CPU cores. But now with these new extensions, we can also give workloads ex exclusive CPU cache, and we can throttle memory bandwidth if we do not want other workloads to take those and uh, from from high priority workloads. And similarly, we can uh, configure block IO priority for high priority jobs. And on the again, we can throttle block IO bandwidth of low priority jobs. And as a result, we can be we can see our most important workloads relax a bit and don't be disturbed by other workloads. So thank you very much. Here are the links to Trio project and RDT and Plock.io. And now I think it's time for questions. <laughs>